Okay, I think uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so I just came from the Kendall talk downstairs. It was packed. I could barely uh, fight my way out of that uh, small room. They should have uh, had them in a bigger room. It was psychiatry grand rounds, and so there were a lot of uh, psychiatrists up front, and then sort of the, the more engineering and uh, non-psychiatry types in the back. And a lot of energy. I think a lot of people are excited about uh, what can happen in neuroscience, uh, bringing new kinds of science and engineering to bear. And hopefully you guys, uh, the, and partly through the case study and, uh, and also through other things that we'll talk about in the course, will get excited by that too if you aren't already. Um, you've, you've done really well so far in the, the case study. It's, uh, it's hopefully been interesting and we'll wrap that up today at the end of lecture. But of course, the, uh, the brain has to act through something, and it acts through muscles, and that interaction is actually of, of great importance, uh, and how the muscles interact with the skeletal system is also very significant, too. And so today we're going to uh, talk about the interaction of neuromuscular and musculoskeletal uh, systems. And we have some great expertise here at Stanford. We're going to cover these major domains. If you're interested in hearing or learning more, a lot of great courses, uh, some real experts as well. Dennis Carter is spending some more time at NSF, so he's less available. Scott Delp is a fantastic uh, bioengineering colleague uh, who runs a muscular, neuromuscular lab and does really some amazing work, and he's contributed to some of the slides here. So generating movement, what, what uh, is the sequence of systems that are interacting? Well, you've got a neural command. We've talked about the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And you end up having to think about uh, then the muscles contracting, and they pull on tendons, and then that leads to questions about musculoskeletal geometry. What are the moments around a joint? What are the forces and the opposing forces that are, are at play? And then to really understand things, you have to think about multi-joint dynamics. Nothing makes sense uh, in isolation. A single joint doesn't tell you how someone walks or fails to walk normally. And all that uh, uh, brings uh, you to your final uh, uh, movement. So it's incredibly complicated, even though at its very simple level, you've just got twitches. If you take a, a muscle, you isolate it, you give it a shock, you see force generation. Okay, we'll talk about how that happens and how it goes wrong. Some interesting temporal dynamics already with that very simple thing. If you start to move your shocks close together, they can uh, uh, summate. You can actually see that a muscle can generate more force if you group two stimuli close together. And in fact, if you carry that out uh, to the limit, you get what's called uh, tetanus. So you get uh, summating force generation that ends up, uh, usually with about 30 hertz activity, gives you a smooth maximal force generation for, for a muscle. And it can be up to about four times the, the peak force of an individual contraction. So all kinds of interesting uh, biochemistry going on that underlies uh, uh, that process, and we'll talk about that. And that lies at the level of the muscle and the muscle tendon dynamics. Much like nerves, there's sequential levels of organization in a the muscle. There are individual uh, muscle cells, uh, but they're bundled together in this uh, hierarchical uh, pattern. Um, a single muscle uh, uh, fiber, uh, on this very fine spatial scale called the sarcomere, two to three microns. Uh, this is uh, corresponding to an individual muscle cell and it has many filaments within it that have or overlapping actin and myosin uh, proteins that generate force. We'll talk about how that works. Those cells are bundled together uh, and into fascicles and then those fascicles are in turn bundled together into uh, skeletal muscles. Um, the actin and myosin actually generate the force and this Sarcoplasmic reticulum entity, this is a calcium-containing intracellular membrane compartment. It's like a little bundle of calcium ions inside cells. It's triggered to release its calcium upon the appropriate stimulation uh, from the nerve, and that calcium triggers muscle contraction through a sequence of steps uh, that we'll talk about. So you've got this actin, and you've got this uh, uh, multiple uh, myosin uh, component system um, that Protein actin, it's about a 43 kilodalton uh, protein. It, it is constituting these uh, so-called uh, thin filaments, uh, which are actin plus a couple of calcium sensors, troponin and tropomyosin. Then uh, uh, you've got uh, this um, uh, array of other uh, very large proteins as well that together make up uh, some of the rest of the, the filament. 
this interesting sort of spring-like protein called Titan. It's one of the biggest uh, uh, proteins in the, in the body, and it, it acts like a sort of a damper. It counteracts passive stretching of muscle. But the actual force, the power stroke is generated at the actin-myosin linkage. And a single molecule generates uh, one to two uh, piconewtons. And this process is pretty interesting. Uh, I'll see if I can play this uh, movie. Okay. So what you see here, there's a few different components. There's the um, uh, actin helix, which is these uh, uh, collection of spherules. You've got this uh, tropomyosin and troponin complex in the magenta and blue. That has to move out of the way to allow the uh, myosin and, and actin to interact. And that uh, is enabled by calcium. The calcium, this little yellow ion, is going to float in and is going to enable this uh, uh, to move aside and allow the interaction of the uh, myosin and actin, as you can see there. The old yellow thing comes in and allows the space to be created. The purple entity moves aside and you can interact. Now you've got other things too. It's ATP dependent. And so you've got a whole ATP that has to come in and it's going to get split into an ADP and a phosphate. And you can see that ha happening as well. And that's a magnesium dependent event. And so you can see the uh, magnesium enabling that and creating for that brief moment when this thing turns orange, you've got an activated uh, protein myosin complex that can execute this uh, one to two piconewton uh, power stroke and uh, drag the actin filament back. So it's a beautifully orchestrated uh, sequence of events. And another way to visualize this in, uh, at the next scale up is to see these, this creates a system where filaments uh, slide against each other. And this corresponds to muscle shortening during the uh, elevation of uh, incoming neural signals. Uh, the muscle contracts and it does that by sliding filaments over each other, retaining its basic structure, but uh, uh, compacting in, in size, okay? So let's do a little little test on this. Uh, this is depolarization of the muscle by an action potential causes release of calcium ions by the SR, triggering a phenomenon termed excitation contraction coupling. Calcium facilitates muscle contraction by hydrolyzing the ATP attached to myosin, binding to troponin, which leads to conformational change and moves tropomyosin out of the way, participating in the cross bridges formed by actin and myosin. And vote your conscience. And very good. So you can see here, uh, answer two. Nobody picked three. Uh, it's binding to and moves that magenta thing out of the way and allows the contraction to happen. Good. By the way, the troponin, uh, if, this is also relevant to cardiac muscle as well as to skeletal muscle, and, and you actually have um, uh, a uh, loss of troponin into the blood. That's one way you can detect heart attacks is uh, damage to heart muscle leads to release of troponin. Actually, that's one of the most sensitive uh, current tests for uh, a cardiac uh, arrest, a cardiac uh, ischemic uh, heart attack. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about musculoskeletal uh, geometry now. Um, and here, uh, some simple calculations that can help you understand uh, the um, uh, concept of moments and balanced opposing forces that explain the mechanical disadvantage that most uh, muscles find themselves at. So uh, this is your biceps. Uh, there's an origin and an insertion point, and this kind of makes the mechanical disadvantage uh, point clear right away. The insertion of your biceps, of course, it's very close to the joint. If it, if it attached out here, that would seem to be much more uh, efficient. It would certainly be the case that it would need to execute less force to counteract a, a weight. But of course, that would create anatomical problems. You don't want your biceps to be uh, spanning your arm like that. So you've got these anatomical constraints uh, that put your muscles at a mechanical disadvantage. Exactly uh, how big an effect is that? Well, you can, you can calculate it. So a few things to keep in mind. Uh, you kind of see things uh, in the balanced state, the equilibrium state, and that helps you understand, first of all, the sum of forces and also the sum of moments around the joint equals zero in the, in the stable case. So the simple forces, uh, the weight coming down, let's say you've got a, a 10 Newton weight, that's got to be balanced by the uh, Y component of the force the muscles generated. Okay, 
So the, the weight minus the, the Y component of the muscle uh, force. But the, uh, if you're not actively uh, rotating or moving the joint, then moments around uh, the joint have to be uh, zero. So the moment here, here's your joint, here's this uh, weight times the distance, that's got to be counteracted by the muscle force and there, okay? So you've got two, mo two moments around the joint that have to balance each other. And that simple equation uh, lets, lets you uh, make some interesting calculations. So, um, for example, we can think about how much force the bicep has to exert to hold up uh, a 10 newton weight. And it turns out it's 50 newtons with this simple calculation. So there's a five to one mechanical disadvantage that's set by anatomical constraints. Uh, and um, you can do additional calculations as well. You can figure out the net uh, direction of the muscle force and so on. That's a kind of very simple calculation, but that's the basis of a lot of uh, calculation that you'll do in designing uh, treatment plans for people who have uh, uh, spastic uh, gait or abnormal uh, movement. And that's illustrated here. So people who have uh, cerebral palsy, for example, will often have uh, abnormal um, the movies in the next slide, but people in, uh, who have uh, cerebral palsy will have abnormal uh, gait. They'll have something called a crouch gait, uh, where due to, it's due to slightly overactive uh, 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 central nervous system commands. And this creates some of the abnormalities. And so you might think, okay, well, maybe we can uh, devise a, a strategy, maybe a surgical strategy. Maybe we can uh, lengthen or shorten a tendon and allow them to, to stand up in, uh, in more normal uh, type gait. But that turns out to be incredibly complicated. You can't uh, uh, just do that. You have to actually think about and model the whole multi-joint uh, system. And so we'll talk about that a little bit too. Uh, there are people uh, who actively work on that. Of course, it's highly coupled to reflexes and feedback control as well. Uh, so you can't just come in with a, a plan that doesn't take that into account. There are also, uh, you know, questions of, of the passive properties of muscles. So there's this passive spring-like component that uh, muscles have that's largely due to this titan protein that uh, acts as a, uh, uh, setting the, the spring constant of the, of the muscle. You have to take that into consideration too. You have to model detailed uh, geometry, and so people use uh, computational mechanics um, to uh, represent the geometry of muscles and bones and compute length, velocities, and moment arms of muscles. And so the DELP lab here at Stanford is really a leader in, in that front. And then finally, you model the dynamics. Uh, there's accelerations and velocities that arise from, from muscle forces. We don't get into much of that there, but if this is something that interests you, you know, I think in, in, our, in this course here, we just want you to be able to understand the mechanical uh, disadvantages that muscles are at. Uh, but if, if you're interested in more detail, there's a lot you can do. This is also, all this is very useful in uh, many fields of endeavor. Uh, people who've uh, studied um, computational uh, models of, of multi-joint dynamics use the same uh, basic uh, uh, imaging systems that were used to help create uh, the computer-generated uh, Gollum and the Lord of the Rings. Uh, basically putting multiple sensors on people that can be tracked and that is data that can be then synthesized uh, computationally and, and used to help create uh, models. So uh, big, uh, some of these are very big data problems as well. If you're executing a complex movement and you have high temporal resolution, you're getting into, uh, you know, a gigabytes or even terabytes of, of data. So, um, Another test, how is joint moment uh, computed? Same problem I had before. I think, what was the uh, drift off? I just put it in the wrong place. All right. All right, now we're polling successfully. So go ahead and, and uh, let's go back to the quiz. Uh, see what we're doing. Yeah. Okay, how is joint moment computed? It's the, is it the sum of the distance of the muscle from the joint axis of rotation and the force applied by the muscle? Is it the product of the distance of the muscle from the joint axis of rotation, force applied by the muscle? 
factors are the product of the length of the muscle and the force applied by the muscle. Good. So everybody got, almost everybody got B, 88 percent. Uh, that's correct. And so that's the kind of uh, simple calculation that uh, it would be good if you uh, were uh, comfortable with. Now, I talked about uh, the uh, crouch gait and cerebral palsy. You can see uh, an example of this. It's quite common, about three in a thousand. Um, very often associated with hypoxia around the time of birth, which can cause be caused by a number of things, uh, blood flow problems uh, in the placenta, through the umbilical cord. Um, but even that is probably only 10 to 20 percent. Uh, other, in other cases, there's not an obvious blood flow, blood flow problem. And so there could be just some developmental uh, deficit or some exposure that we don't fully understand, a toxin, um, infectious agent back during some critical period. One theme is that it, it tends to look like uh, a hyperactivity very often. So you've got this uh, uh, spasticity, which uh, is bad, and then often gets worse. And so it's very, uh, this uh, interaction of ongoing physical therapy, trying to keep joints extended, loosened, um, and try to facilitate gait, and you're fighting against some ongoing process that continues to make it. The, the spasticity worse and worse. Um, and again, now, you, you know, there's, think about treating, well, what, what are you going to do? Yeah. You know, it, it doesn't get uh, better. So uh, phys the spasticity itself doesn't get better. The physical uh, therapy uh, can sometimes help in, in lengthening the muscles. There are surgical interventions that can help in lengthening the muscle. Uh, but but it's there's not a, a natural uh, recovery process that that, that helps most uh, people suffer from it. But then you think about treatments. Well, if it's simple overactivity of outgoing pathways, so the idea would be maybe you can inhibit that. The problem is, uh, you know, just like with seizures, there's immense side effects. These are people who are sometimes, but not always, cognitively impaired as well. And so you certainly don't want to dampen down their attention, their memory. And many of the medications that you would use to do that would, would also cause those side effects. Uh, you could think about muscle relaxants, and there are things that inhibit muscle uh, contraction, but those will tend to cause uh, more flaccid or weak uh, uh, strength in, in, in a more global fashion, and that can worsen problems as well, actually even increase spasticity. And finally, there are surgical things, and, and you know, because this, this kind of gait can actually because they're kind of stuck in this posture for a number of years, that actually affects their ongoing development as they grow. And so the, the tendon ends up being too short, okay, because they're in this position where it ends up being too long, and so it ends up being the, the wrong length. And then you think, okay, what well, are the surgical options? Can we lengthen or shorten the tendon? And, but that is, uh, if, if you do that wrong, you've got a serious problem. If you lengthen the tendon just a little too much, then it's floppy and the muscle can't uh, exert a power stroke on the skeleton, you can make things worse. And if you, if you make it a, a little uh, too short, of course, that'll worsen the spasticity. And even if you hit it right, often that has no effect on the crouch gait. And this is because we don't understand uh, the full details of the uh, multi-joint dynamics that create the gait. And so a huge opportunity for, for uh, engineers to think uh, in an intelligent fashion about this. Um, you know, we mentioned surgery. Uh, you know, maybe there are other kinds of uh, things you could do for spinal cord injury people are looking at sort of electrode-based stimulations we've talked about. People who have uh, stroke, uh, you know, some of these rehab programs are very repetitive, and so maybe they could, you could have not an uh, occupational therapist or physical therapist, but an actual uh, robot to handle this. And so this is something that people are working on. How could we, uh, particularly for stroke, but it might be relevant for cerebral palsy or other um, musculoskeletal disorders, could we have a, sort of an automated rehab process? Uh, certainly being thought about for cerebral palsy and uh, for uh, Parkinson's disease as well. Of course, you could also think about designing whole new uh, body parts. Uh, and this is something that's you know, separate from the cerebral palsy question, but this is an active area of bioengineering research. There are people trying to build um, uh, physical devices that will actually receive uh, neural signals and will execute uh, uh, 
corresponding movements. There are um, a few limitations to this. One is you have to understand the neural signals that are coming. Where do you record from? Did you record in, in motor cortex? Do you record from an outgoing nerve? Uh, where do you pick your, your signals from? And um, because we don't really know the neural code for anything, what people have settled on is, is looking at uh, nearby uh, moving uh, muscles that are already uh, connected. And so you can actually think about strategies where you move an already wired in nerve like a pectoral muscle and actually use that uh, uh, as a, a source of uh, uh, signals. And so that creates a, a, an electrical signal in the muscle. And that's something we understand, muscle contraction. Okay, and let's use that. We can pick up that signal uh, either by the force or uh, the equivalent of an EKG to detect the uh, electrical signal. And antennas will pick that up and turn that into prosthetic movement. So there's this kind of a workaround that people are, are thinking about. And this is a limitation to the fact that we don't know the neural code for movement. We don't know the pattern of neural activity in the motor cortex that means reach or grab. And Krishna Shinoy's lab here at Stanford, he's working in monkeys uh, uh, recording in motor cortex during very well-defined reach tasks. Um, and probably is one of the, the world leaders in that. Try to get you that movie. But this shows as an example of Crouchgate. I think it didn't copy across. It wasn't embedded there. But uh, that's it's actually a really helpful thing to, to see the, uh, the Crouchgate in operation. So we've talked about these things, things for you guys to think about, understanding the simulations, understanding the physical basis for force production, and thinking about uh, prosthetic devices and, and regeneration. That's on sort of the neuromuscular front, um, and we've talked a lot about the uh, neuromuscular junction as well. But now there's a whole host of things on the, the skeleton uh, and, and the tissues that link to uh, the muscle, the bone, the cartilage, the tendons, and ligaments, and the joints. Also a big part of bioengineering. So, uh, you know, this falls into many categories. Where do musculoskeletal disorders arise from? Uh, how can you prevent injury? Uh, how can you design artificial joints best? And how can you repair fractures best? That's the best kind of rehab. And there's a huge uh, market for that. So what is, what is bone? Well, it's a, it's a connective tissue. It's got cells, it's alive, but it's also got non-living components. It's got uh, crystallized salts, calcium and phosphate. Uh, and those crystals are embedded within a collagen matrix. Collagen is a protein, uh, and so you've got these collagen fibrils with, uh, with uh, crystals embedded within them. So it provides structure, protects internal organs, provides the site for muscle attachment, and actually serves as a calcium and phosphate reservoir that can be recruited as needed. Uh, so you've got about 206. You start with more, but some of them fuse. Um, end up with less later. Uh, the smallest bone is the thapes or stirrup in your eardrum, and the longest bone is the femur or thigh bone. And there's two main types. Um, there's the so-called compact or cortical bone. That's most bone. Uh, that's for, intended for very, very strong uh, 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 roles of the skeleton. Um, and sometimes embedded within these long uh, compact or cortical bones, you have this uh, it's definitely a different type. It's called cancellous or trabecular bone. It's kind of a spongy in appearance. It's got more cells in it. Uh, bone marrow lives within this uh, sort of zone. Uh, new blood cells are created. It's important. Uh, it's very metabolically important. It's got a big blood supply. Um, and so uh, see more of this trabecular bone in the rib cage, in the backbone, in the skull, and in some parts of long bones. Okay, now uh, they have different strengths as well, and uh, different uh, susceptibility to fracture. So let's talk about fracture for a little bit. Uh, you know, the huge discrepancy in where fractures appear depending on age. If you're over 65, almost all the fractures occur in the hip. If you're under 65, <clears throat> they're almost all in arm and leg. Due to increased risky behavior. Using limbs that uh, is done in people under 65, and the, the hip joint itself seems to be, uh, particularly at the uh, joint of the ball of the ball and socket uh, joint, is, is quite susceptible to uh, weakening as people get older. Um, 
And so this is something we'd like to quantify, we'd like to understand and model. And so this raises questions. How do you measure bone strength? What factors influence bone strength? How does it deteriorate over time and why? And, and can we then predict and prevent and, and treat fractures? And so this leads to, uh, you know, thinking how, how we're going to quantify the deformability of bone. And this leads to uh, the stress uh, strain relationship concept. Now, uh, there's a force which we measure in Newtons. And um, the key relationship to understand here is, is the, the Young's modulus. Okay? And that tells you uh, the relationship between stress and strain. So strain is dimensionless entity, it's, if, when you apply a force, it's the change in the dimension, let's say length, uh, as a ratio of the initial length, okay? So it's the response to the uh, stress. The stress is the newtons per square meter, force per unit area. And that stress-strain relationship is uh, linked by this Young's modulus, okay? So different materials have different Young's moduli, uh, stainless steel about 200, oak about 12, polyvinyl chloride, and pipes, for example, is about two. Uh, it describes material deformation under uh, load. Cortical and trabecular bone are different. Cortical bone is actually uh, about 17 gigapascals. Uh, trabecular is, is much, much less. So right away, we might think, okay, this is going to relate to deformability. Uh, and possibly to fracture, and the ratio of these two different components might be uh, relevant. Um, but a single number doesn't tell you everything, okay? So um, a, even a particular bone is going to have a longitudinal modulus and a transverse modulus. It depends on where the force is coming. There's also a shear modulus. Um, and it also depends on exactly where you measure. The precise orientation of the collagen fibrils will set the, the, the Young's modulus along different axes. Other loads that are happening at the same time matter. So you've got uniaxial versus multiaxial loading. Uh, and for a particular trabecular bone, that can vary over uh, the age of an individual. Um, and so you actually have a, a huge uh, range of different possible Young's moduli. And that, in turn, has a complex relationship to uh, strength. So what's called the ultimate strength is the, the stress at which bone will fracture. Not just to form, but, but break. And cortical bone, um, there are different uh, ultimate strengths. And those, these, again, like the Young's modulus, depend on the type of, of uh, a stressor that's, uh, that's, that's put on them. Um, and so you can have, uh, depending on shear versus uh, compression versus uh, tension, you can have different uh, ultimate strengths before fracture. This, though, tends to decrease per eight with age. Um, so this is quantifiable. You have about a 2% drop per decade in your uh, ultimate strength. And so you're more susceptible to uh, fractures. Um, and the properties are a little different with trabecular bone, but you've got a faster drop off uh, with age for trabecular bone. OK. And so questions you know, come up, how can we? not use just a single number? How can we account for multi-axial loading? And realize also that the properties are, are time dependent. And so there are people uh, working on this uh, as well. Uh, so there's a reference here. Uh, but the actual, some of this is remarkably dynamic, even within the course of a single exercise session. And so you can have stress-strain relationships change in cortical bone depending on how fast uh, someone is walking. And this has to do, presumably, with sort of multi-axial loading, what else is pulling on a, a bone at the same time, and how that affects properties. It needs to be uh, uh, more deeply understood. Then there's fatigue. So there's this uh, concept of what happens you know, before fracture, or perhaps leading up to fracture. And uh, you know, this, this is an interesting question. Uh, what is fatigue? Uh, is this a process that, um, that leads up to fracture? Possibly it's just a change in the properties of the bone, in any case, under cyclic or, or repetitive loading. And is this due to micro fractures that happen, or is it due to some other uh, process? Um, we know that uh, you, know, you can work with an animal bone in the laboratory. You can put it through you know, thousands of cycles of, of uh, compression, and you can measure the uh, cycles to failure. And, and uh, look at that as a uh, uh, 
at the stress as a, as a function of the uh, cycle for failure. And so people are studying this as well. But you can actually, if you've, if you've gone through a heavily f fatigued uh, uh, preparation, you actually can fracture at, at, at remarkably uh, smaller uh, stress levels. So one theory has come out, this is called Miner's Rule. It's not completely right by any means, so don't take it as, uh, as uh, you know, uh, precisely true. But there's a thought that, uh, you know, each cycle of compression contributes to a roughly linear uh, accumulation of uh, fatigue. Um, and that it's simply additive. And that, that accounts somewhat, but doesn't account uh, for everything. There are uh, much more complex models. We're actually not going to go into this in, in detail, but people are trying to understand the, the, the rate of damage accumulation is important. So if you spread out those cycles over a longer time, it'll be more resistant. If you, if you have those cycles compressed over a shorter period of time, you'll have more. So a lot of uh, complexity miners rule does not account for everything that's, that's needed. Now bone is living. Um, it has cells in it. Uh, and is constantly remodeling for, uh, for many reasons. So people who have exerted a lot of uh, repetitive cycles of uh, compression on their bones, they'll have stronger, thicker bones. Uh, tennis players, the bones in their uh, more active arm are much, much thicker and stronger than those in their less active arm. Um, and so this is completely uh, separate from the muscle itself, uh, but of course it might relate to the muscle use, probably does. Uh, is it the muscle tugging on the bone on the tendon that causes that? And is there something inside the bone that's responding to that stress and strain and then leading to production of more bone? Makes sense, but it's kind of interesting. Biochemically and cellularly, how is that happening? Is there, you know, who's, who's sensing that uh, stress? Is it the collagen fibrils that are sending a signal to cells that are instructing them to make more bone? Um, and there are cells that could be uh, receiving that signal. There are Osteoblasts, which are bone-forming cells derived from bone marrow that are basically there uh, waiting to respond to this sort of signal. There even, you know, it even seems as though this is innervated. There are neurons that uh, are present in uh, trabecular bone. You can actually see nerve terminals staining for them. And what the neural control of that is, we don't fully understand. But many different signals they could respond to, endocrine signals. And so they can build bone. Um, there are also osteoclasts, which uh, break down bone. They seem more designed to, to reduce bone density. They uh, secrete uh, uh, compounds that lead to uh, the solubilization of calcium and phosphate. And these are all under control of uh, many different kinds of signals. Um, so there's bone uh, constant resorption, constant formation over your lifetime, certainly not static. Um, there's a process by which uh, osteo pre-osteoclasts can be recruited from uh, a, um, a stem cell-like population to come to the bone surface and initiate a bone resorption. If you're in a calcium deficient state, that will activate these osteoclasts to break down some bone and release calcium. Also, phosphate deficiency will, will lead to that. Um, osteoclasts also uh, uh, can help set the stage for the formation of new bone by osteoblasts. And the osteoblasts will, when there's plenty of uh, uh, appropriate signals, but also plenty of calcium and phosphate, they can lead to the formation. Um, so very activity dependent. Um, but you can see bone looks very different uh, over age, and this is probably due to um, a combination of different use patterns uh, and different uh, aging related signals. The, Dominant theme, we mentioned this earlier, is that there's this much accelerated rate of loss of the trabecular uh, bone with age. And so uh, what you can see is less of that sort of interstitial space as a function of age and much more of this uh, very continuous uh, uh, cortical uh, bone. Now, um, cortical bone, of course, is itself is more uh, robust. And so this is a little paradoxical that cortical bone is does have a, a more robust Young's modulus, uh, but it's probably the uh, geometry that's uh, not uh, uh, conducive to a robust stress strain relationship that leads to uh, bones being weaker in the more advanced stage, even though there's a relative reduction of, uh, of trabecular. 
Um, there are uh, pathological cases where, separate from age, where resorption rate can be greater than formation, uh, mineral deficiencies being among the most common ones. Bone remodeling, um, this is, relates to the tennis player uh, uh, question. Um, there's this Wolf's Law, which basically states what we've said informally, that the idea is that bone will form if it experiences more stress than physiologic and will uh, absorb or removed if there's less stress than physiologic. And people, yeah. Well, the normal, yeah, good question. Then whatever the normal pattern had been up to that point, so whatever the baseline is. And so you'll see, you know, in astronauts, for example, who spent a lot of time in the space station, their, their physiological pattern was their normal baseline. And then, you know, with reduced um, force exerted on muscles will actually exhibit significant bone loss relative to their baseline. Um, and, and the pattern, yeah. Yeah, the question is, do you get uh, with uh, overactive osteoclasts, are there conditions where you get bone degradation over time? Uh, certainly, uh, that is the sort of thing that might be going on in osteoporosis. Um, I'm not aware of a sort of a specific, uh, sort of a cancer, osteoclast-like cancer, that sort of thing. Um, endocrine conditions, yeah, go ahead. You want to say a little more about Paget's? It's actually, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, and that's an instructive point. The you know how we develop is different from how we remodel, and and as we all know, just like the central nervous nervous system not rewiring perfectly after injury or not at all, likewise bone reformation is not perfect when it's in this re recovery mode or this disease mode. Uh, the the other thing is you see <clears throat> um, there are if you think about the hip joint, and this is a pretty imp interesting uh, joint. There are um, now, right at this neck here, there's a lot of interesting things happening. This is where a lot of the fractures happen associated with increased uh, age. And you can actually see that right around that neck is where some of the most interesting adaptations happen. Uh, and so you actually see uh, with increased loading, there's a lot of uh, uh, increased uh, a density of bone that happens there. And with, with uh, decreased loading right around this region is where you tend to see a uh, density. And so the precise dimensions of where the remodeling happens and the spots that it happen are, are very important. Yeah. I, th I uh, believe that's true based on that being the case for virtually every other regenerative process in, in age. I don't know any data on that point exactly. I, I don't know if any of you guys know about that, but I assume that's that's the case. Almost all Virtually every remodeling process and, and, and part of the reason for that is every tissue has its own native stem cell populations that do give rise to, in, in bone. It'll give rise to new osteoblasts and, and uh, uh, in the brain give rise to new, new neurons. But those stem cell populations or progenitor populations, they reduce over age. That's clear. In every tissue you look at, you see reduced stem cell populations. And that could be part of the general uh, loss of remodeling capability. Um, but all these things, uh, there are growth factors, the incredibly complicated, what are the trophic factors that drive the proliferation, differentiation, phenotype, maintenance, and consolidation of the different cells and, and their balance. And uh, 
there are a whole host of different proteins that are involved. There are the bone morphogenetic proteins, BMPs, which just as they sound uh, are incredibly important. They receive extracellular signals. The receptors receive the BMPs, and that activates signaling cascades. In this case, it's the so-called SMAD signaling cascade that, that regulates gene expression. Uh, you know, there are other factors as well, insulin-like growth factors, transforming growth factors, and all these uh, are, are, can be regulated by different uh, incoming signals and also change with uh, various disease states. Now there are people using growth factors trying to design interventions. Uh, if, you, if you know there's a protein that's involved, maybe you can deliver it. And so people are working on ways of delivering, for example, bone morphogenetic proteins to increase uh, strength. And this is an interesting uh, device um, made by Wyeth. Uh, there's an absorbable absorbable collagen sponge that's derived from a cow collagen, and they've infused that with recombinant human BMP2, and this has been used, and it's being explored for use in, uh, in big fracture voids where there's a, such a big fracture that you can't just uh, uh, join the two pieces of bone together smoothly, um, uh, possibly as a preventative treatment for osteoporosis. So this is a nice kind of device, molecular combination type thing. Okay, miner's rule. Going, okay, so based on miner's rule, bone damage or fatigue is cumulative, which of the following are true for fatigue accumulation? It depends on the total number of stress levels to which bone was exposed, depending on the total number of cycles to which bone was exposed. Bone will fail or fracture when the number of cycles until fatigue is reached for any individual stress level is reached, or when the sum of all stress levels exceeds the total stress limit of the bone, or all of the above. That's a little complicated there. You know, it's funny, we had a simpler version of this one. I don't think it made it through. I had, yeah, I had a better version of this. Anyway, we'll, we'll see what people say, and then we'll, we'll, we'll give the final answer. Miner's rule, of course, is, is too simple, but it's good to know at least what its simple form is. That's the form at which you'll uh, incorporate, and in, indeed, uh, people said uh, overwhelmingly either uh, B, which is correct, it's the, it relates to the full number of cycles to which the bone was exposed, but also a fair number of people said all of the above, which is Yeah, I, I, I can, but I'll just say those two, B and D were are both correct, given that uh, C was a little confusingly <laughs> written. This is the core point, though. This is what miner's rule, rule actually is. It's the total number of cycles, and it's a linear uh, accumulation. All right, we'll, we'll post the correct version of that slide. <coughs> Let's talk about cartilage and then tendons and ligaments. So cartilage is very important. It's, uh, you know, some organisms get by without any bone at all. Sharks are completely composed of, uh, of, of cartilage in terms of their skeleton. Um, and this is a similar basic theme. There's a cell, and then there's an extracellular matrix. The chondrocytes are a cell type that uh, lives just like osteoblasts. Uh, and they live in a matrix of proteoglycans, which are these uh, uh, protein sugar uh, uh, structural components of the extracellular matrix. And again, collagen fibrils, different kind of collagen than what bone has. It's got a lot of water, 70% water. Um, in cartilage proper, there are no blood vessels or nerves, but around the periphery there is, and so there's, it's very dependent on diffusion to get nutrients in. So there. And there are different kinds. There's yellow elastic or uh, fiber cartilage, and that's like what's in your earlobe. And then you've got your sort of load-bearing white uh, fiber cartilage that's in your intervertebral discs. Um, and then finally, you've got articular cartilage that's designed to be very uh, slippery uh, and allow bones to, to rotate on them, and that's called articular cartilage that's uh, on joint surfaces. You've got different kinds, uh, and they play different roles. Uh, you know, largely, you know, articular cartilage is designed to minimize friction and wear, um, and it distributes joint load over a wider uh, area. Uh, extremely important, for example, in the knee, very hard working uh, joint. And it's got very interesting material properties. Um, very strong. Uh, 
for hydrostatic pressure, since it's mostly water. Water is not very compressible. Uh, and has a, a wide uh, Young's modulus uh, strain, uh, depending on within the, the uh, stress strain relationship that you're residing in. So it operates over a very wide uh, dynamic range. Now it degenerates over time. Um, this is part of normal aging as it, as it, there's use and there's a gradual loss, even independent of use of uh, proteoglycans. The cartilage becomes less uh, effective. Particular or its load bearing role. And osteoarthritis, uh, this is extremely common. It's a degenerative joint disease. It affects more than 80% of people over age 75. It tends to show up in the weight bearing joints, the wear and tear joints. This is, uh, can be confusing. It's different from rheumatoid arthritis, which is an active autoimmune. Uh, process where the immune system is attacking the joints. This is, even though it sounds similar, osteoarthritis is not that. It's a chronic wear and tear condition, but it ends up, it can look at least superficially the same. There's a lot of pain in the joints, uh, difficulty associated with use, uh, treated very differently. In one case, you would give a immune uh, suppressing uh, agent, and in another case, you would not. Um, but extremely common and loss of cartilage being the core issue. So how would you treat that? Well, there are behavioral things you can do. Uh, you can control pain, anti-inflammatories. You can improve uh, you know, strategies for joint use. You identify where the pain is coming from in a patient. Devise for them actions or, or behavioral patterns that allow them to avoid uh, encountering that issue. That can be very effective. Uh, exercise and weight loss helps a lot. Weight loss, reducing the, the loads that the joints are. Um, you know, these anti-inflammatory agents help a little bit, but they have their own risks with chronic use. You can have GI uh, uh, bleeds, kidney failure, and so on associated with Some dietary supplements might help. It's a little less clear. Um, this is an extreme form of a. <laughs> Uh, you know, anti-inflammation, but this sometimes this is done corticosteroid injections. This uh, for people who are over 75 or 80, if they can get a corticosteroid injection, it's like I've had one friend who I sometimes fish with who says it's like crack for for old people. They just they can get a corticosteroid injection. Everything is great for for a couple of weeks, and it really changes their lives. But again, you can't chronically do that. Huge side effects associated with you know, with chronic corticosteroid use, obesity, psychosis, a whole bunch of other things. Um, and then, of course, there's surgery. So you could come in and say, okay, cartilage is deficient, let's replace the cartilage. Um, or let's take out the parts that are not working well, replace uh, uh, them with something stable, or maybe we can trigger a regrowth of, of uh, cartilage in some way. And so there are strategies uh, for that as well. Okay, test. Which of the following are true? I've activated it uh, for osteoarthritis. Primarily affects weight-bearing joints like the knees and hips. Commonly affects women in the age range of 30 to 45. Has an autoimmune pathophysiology where immune cells attack antigens present in the joints. Bed rest is generally advised for all patients with osteoarthritis or all of the above. Great. So I like this question, and you guys got it perfect. The distinction being everything else here, these are closely related to rheumatoid arthritis, not osteoarthritis, and as far as activity is, is very helpful. So that's a key distinction. Um, and now let's get on to tendons, ligaments, and uh, joints. So uh, a tendon and a ligament, what's the difference? A ligament is a bone-to-bone -bone connection. Tendon is a muscle to bone connection. They operate under different constraints, but they're both connective tissues. They're both composed largely of uh, fibroblasts, a key cell type, and then there's uh, water and collagen fibers again, much like cartilage. It's about 50% water. Um, tendon fibers are, are nearly all oriented along the long axis of the tendon. Ligaments tend to form a more uh, weaving inter. Uh, 
connected or crossed pattern. Um, ligaments, in many cases, are just there to provide additional stability. It's kind of like a mesh or a network, whereas a tendons are part of the real active transmission of tensile loads uh, and extremely maintaining the posture and the form of, of the skeleton. Now, they have their own uh, moduli and, and ultimate strengths, and their behavior is also time dependent. So, some of the same things we've talked about for bone uh, relate to tendon. Uh, we'll rehash that, but similar principles, but you can see some of the, uh, the moduli and the ultimate stress relationships uh, indicated there. So, they have their own mechanical properties that are important to consider. And then they, of course, uh, fracture or rupture. And this, the mechanism is probably similar for ligaments and tendons. Yeah, so creep is um, a process of, uh, it's a little bit like the increased uh, uh, um, accumulation of fatigue. Uh, it's um, the, the fact that there, there can be a steady increase in the length of a, of a tendon or ligament with uh, repeated um, application of stress. And, and this is actually, um, so it's a lengthening that happens over time. And so you can imagine, again, for, if we go back to the cerebral palsy case, um, you know, where we have the crouch gait and things are, are, are uh, abnormal for that reason, could you take advantage of creep and apply mechanically a very repetitive uh, uh, stress and maybe lengthen uh, a tendon? And that would be preferable to a surgical thing, which might be a little more uh, likely to, uh, to have a, a serious consequences of failure. That's under active exploration. We'd like to understand creep better, you know, which, which biochemical signals enable it, which inhibit it, and, and uh, um, model it better in the laboratory so we can apply it to patients better. Um, so, uh, and again, with, you know, it, it's not all beautiful creeping and lengthening. You, are there also, if you do it wrong, you're going to get micro, you know, failures, micro fractures along the way, and will those accumulate and, and predispose to rupture later, um, and that's something that's understood as well. Um, and people are, you know, you can take cadaver knees and, and really you can look at these uh, uh, stress strain ultimate uh, fracture relationships in cadaver knees with, uh, uh, in the laboratory. And you, of course you can do it in animal models uh, as well. Joints, pretty interesting. A lot of uh, very interesting joints in the body. Um, they all use different Many, use many different mechanical principles. Um, we've got some uh, ball and socket joints, like the shoulder and the, and, and the hip. Uh, then there's the hinge joints, like the elbow. Uh, there are uh, pivot joints, like uh, the base of our skull interacts with our spinal column on basically a pivot joint. And then there are those that are designed for more uh, smooth rotation. Uh, so the wrist joints are, have these uh, this sort of ellipsoidal structure. So everything depends, of course, on the kind. Expected. The knee is the most abused uh, joint. Uh, it has a lot of pressure on it due to its sort of recently acquired uh, vulnerability and evolution. Um, it's, uh, it bears a lot of weight relative to what it does in other uh, closely related species. And uh, it's uh, question, yeah. Um, there's a couple things, and actually the answer is uh, uh, different um, actually for men and women also. So there's a, a few interesting things. The, uh, first of all, actually, uh, there's the angle at which the uh, femurs come down to interact with the joint, and that's a different angle in men and women. That, in, in women, that angle has gotten uh, bigger more recently with evolution uh, associated with increased cradle capacity in childbirth, and you actually have a very uh, different mechanical relationship of the uh, incoming uh, angle of the femur and the tibia, uh, and that's a, a probably the most recent historical development. Going much farther back, though, uh, we actually evolved from uh, organisms that had <clears throat> uh, were pretty low to the ground uh, and had uh, sort of this sort of lizard-like uh, uh, placement of um, the, the limbs, where you've got uh, the uh, Fore limb and then the uh, more proximal part of the limb, and you're, you're actually not bearing much weight on the, this uh, particular structure. It's more of a hinge that's designed to link the body to the uh, lower part of the uh, of the limb that actually is making contact with the ground. 
And as we evolved upright posture, uh, all of a sudden now, instead of just serving as that sort of connector role, now the full body weight, almost the full body weight is being borne uh, on this, uh, th this knee joint. So it's an upright posture, first of all, we've only got two legs and oftentimes we're on one as we're running. And so that's a very unusual thing, uh, but also the, 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 the full weight being uh, directed toward that joint. So it's upright posture, it's cranial capacity, um, and uh, probably other things too. Any other thoughts? But those are, you know, we have much more, and then there's the things we do, you know, playing football and so on. That's a pretty recent evolutionary thing. Um, and a lot of what is structured around the, the knee is, is designed though to help provide stability. So we've got these different ligaments, the anterior cruciate ligament, the posterior cruciate, the medial collateral, lateral collateral. Each of these are, pro provide some uh, uh, stability, but they're under immense uh, pressure and then can, can fracture or tear. So what, what creates an ACL tear? Um, not really known. Uh, there's a popular theory that uh, if due to a particular action that's taken, um, the quadriceps pull the tibia forward and the hamstrings are not active and not generating enough balancing force, the joint is going to be deep displaced and the ACL will be stretched uh, and possibly torn. So what kind of movement would create uh, imbalanced um, quadriceps and hamstring action on the joint? You know, uh, it's not really known. There are a few cases where there are um, We'll also post this movie that didn't get embedded either, but there's an actual movie which we'll put online for you of a of a ACL injury actually happening. Um, and the frustrating thing is it's not obvious. So you can see this this woman running, and the motion that she took just before the ACL fracture was identical to the motions that she was taking, uh, you know, prior to that moment. Uh, and so it's not as if there was a a wildly, uh, you know, extreme excursion, and it's in, in limb motion or position. Um, and so then you start to have questions. Well, was this one of these accumulative things that happened, and uh, was it just uh, micro tears that uh, led to susceptibility? Um, and and we don't really know. Uh, but that that will be an interesting thing. We'll, we'll make sure. You... So what do you do then? Well. Um, you got a torn ACL, you can come in and you can sew it back together. You can do that arthroscopically, that's gotten pretty good. Uh, you don't have to do open uh, surgeries. Um, you can also design artificial joints, and that's an active area of bioengineering. Uh, you know, if we can't, if it gets so dysfunctional that you can't repair it, can you uh, design a new kind of joint? And so there's an active sort of cottage industry of, of trying to design uh, new kinds of, of, of knee joints uh, associated with uh, very severe damage. A lot of people who've had chronic and repeated loss of multiple ligaments uh, uh, will end up uh, uh, wanting to think about artificial joints. So uh, just to summarize, we've talked about uh, types of, and functions of different tissues in the system. Uh, we've talked about the material properties. Uh, we've talked about um, sort of the bioengineering approach to understanding, quantifying, modeling, and, and designing therapies. And there's some supplemental material. I want to save time. So, uh, you know, this is for your own interest. Uh, uh, what in the slides that are after here, you uh, just take a look at them if you're interested. But I want to get right, uh, see if there's any questions, then we'll get right to the, uh, the case study at the end. Any questions, Joe? Do you have a comment? Yeah, I have a That's got its own, so that's absolutely true. Then it's always got its own problems. And, uh, you know, obviously that's a much more you know, serious surgery and it's got its own complications. So you, you tore your ACL? Yep. How, how are you doing it? 
What, what was the actual motion that did it? Um, Testing. There's no impact. It was just you doing a very forceful testing. Yeah, so these are, um, these are these uh, combination of device and biologicals, uh, and this, this gets a whole other interesting thing on FDA approval. You've got a combination of a physical device that's secreting a growth factor. So, uh, you know, we mentioned the bone morphogenetic proteins for bone. It's an analogous thing for cartilage. There are, uh, are growth factors that facilitate cartilage regrowth. Then, then there's a, even a, a totally separate strategy, which is there's a, uh, a company that's making completely within the lab, there's a scaffold and they're seeding chondrocytes uh, onto it. This is for cartilage, exactly. And they're, they end up creating a, it's sort of a, a disc-like thing uh, that looks like it could serve a cartilage type role and they're, they're transplanting that. And the neat thing about that is they're using autologous chondrocytes from that same patient. So they can take out a little bit of your own chondrocytes, grow them in the lab, expand them, seed them into this uh, scaffold. It actually gets pretty dense and cartilage-like. Um, I haven't checked in on that field in about a year or so, so uh, maybe we'll, we'll look into that and get you guys an update. Maybe if you guys could, uh, could help me take a look. There's a company that was actively doing that up until about a year ago, and, and uh, kind of a neat thing. And then they just stick that right into the patient. I, I, I'll find it. I, I looked into it about a year ago, and it's, uh, maybe they've gone bankrupt since then. But. Yeah. I actually don't know. Do you guys know? So the traditional muscle pull, uh, is it, what is that? Physically, is that known? I was envisioned that it was a, a micro tear of some kind that then got. Muscles, the muscle itself is, is all cellular, so it actually, that is good because it regenerates uh, more, more readily. And so I, I think uh, it probably is a rupture of a, of a, of a, a myofibril uh, or a group of them. Muscles, uh, they normally don't divide. You know, these are, also skeletal muscle is kind of an interesting cellular structure. It's a, it's a syncytium. There are many nuclei uh, that are enclosed within a single topological uh, plasma membrane. And uh, so it, it normally doesn't divide. It doesn't have traditional mitosis and, and so on. But, so it, but it has, that probably enables it to have a pretty robust response uh, uh, to injury too. You've got multiple nuclei, you've got, uh, a more robust uh, structure. It's not as if a tear will kill a cell and you need to activate a process of stem cell regrowth. It's more like you damage this long syncytium and the nuclei are activated to regrow and produce more, more structure. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and that hyperactivity, you know, can, can be intrinsic to the muscle, and sometimes it's due to overstimulation from the nervous system. Okay, so uh, great discussion. If you have other thoughts, feel free to, to email us uh, or follow up uh, in office hours.
Let's talk about the case study. This was pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Let's see where it ended up going. So here's how the patient, so first of all, you'll continue to do great. Uh, we really love the thought that you're, you're putting into it. Uh, I'll tell you how this case played out. So the patient was treated uh, with a perception. Now that you see these anti-NMDA receptor antibodies, clearly the immune system is involved. So what you do then is you try to suppress the immune system and also do uh, surgery. Okay, so two things were, were, were done. IV methylprednisolone. This has its own risks, uh, but uh, for an acute autoimmune-related process, uh, that's definitely indicated, particularly if it's uh, as serious as this patient was experiencing. And also, the surgery was carried out and the cyst was removed, okay? So patient got better initially. The patient was able to answer questions and write her name, so that's gone from non-responsive to that. That's pretty good. Uh, she was, uh, had her tracheostomy tube removed uh, on post-op day three. So she got better until post-op day six, when she became agitated, got paranoid, and had hallucinations again. Fixed lateral collis. What's that? That's this. Sometimes you can get these, these spasticities that happen. This is retro collis, neck going back. This is lateral collis, and it's very strange sometimes. It develops these weird fixed uh, postures. Um, that had also occurred before treatment, so it looked like things were getting uh, uh, Certainly not uh, uh, working ideally. What could be going on here? The cyst is gone. Well, there's still, you know, the antibodies are still around, right? So we've got a, an issue here. Um, uh, we've got the causative problem out, um, but how long are these antibodies going to stick around? Um, and so then our old friend IVIG comes along. Okay, we talked about this a little bit. And so they gave her a pretty uh, serious intravenous uh, human immunoglobulin try to interrupt the ongoing process that resulted from the circulating antibodies. Anxiety and paranoia diminished, and she went to rehab facility on the 35th hospital day. So that's progress. Two months out, living at home with parents. That's better than being in the rehab facility. Um, but withdrawn and uninterested in things she used to do, sleeping 15 to 18 hours a day. So what's going on here? Yeah, it could be. Uh, depressive therapy was begun. So why did the depression follow that? Again, if we understood depression, I might be able to answer that. Um, but we know the hippocampus is involved in memory and mood, and we know she was driving it hard with these antibodies for a while. Maybe there was some kind of damage or fatigue that, that resulted from that, and that triggered depression. At the six-month follow-up, though, after antidepressant therapy, she actually resumed driving and working, uh, had her job back, Affect, meaning her, her public display of mood had, had recovered somewhat. Uh, but she had some, uh, some significant weight gain, 32 kilograms in four months. Okay, That can be a side effect of antidepressants, but that's a pretty big weight gain in four months. Um, was it the prednisolone that can cause weight gain, but that was a while back? Um, or is it just her altered activity pattern? Uh, some, sometimes it's a combination of all of these things. Neuropsych testing, intact memory, so that's great. Some inattention, some difficulty with calculation, slow information processing. So persistent deficits, um, and presumably those will continue to slowly correct over time. In the last few minutes, I want to share uh, this. I mentioned this book last time, uh, Brain on Fire, a really interesting popular press book. Uh, a young woman who lived in uh, New York uh, was a journalist, uh, and basically this thing happened to her, okay, out of nowhere. And, and she had a very difficult time before she was diagnosed. Uh, she was basically, she didn't quite get into this uh, non-responsive state, but she got into this permanently crazy state. And she was heading toward, until she, the, she found a doctor that made the correct diagnosis, she was headed toward what would have been probably a lifetime of, of failed medication, uh, institutionalization. And it raises the question of what other psychiatric diseases are really due to something like this that might be treatable if we just knew what they were. So she's, she had some, she was treated with IVIG too. This is just a couple interesting quotes from the book. She describes sort of the this IVIG uh, process. Uh, you know, they gave her a lot, um, enough that came from more than a thousand blood donors, um, expensive, and she just was remarking on how 
intense and crude and expensive this treatment is, it ended up uh, uh, saving her, but uh, uh, the experience of IVIG uh, treatment was an interesting description. She also highlighted how terrifying it was, that how poorly understood it was. That was in 09. She was only the 217th person ever to receive that diagnosis. As the awareness grew, numbers in the thousands, obviously there's not an epidemic going on, it's just increased uh, awareness that this kind of thing can happen. Um, but it raises the, the question, I mean, she, she talks about the doctor who did his best and failed to make the, the diagnosis, and you know, she attributes it to various social political things, which could be the case, but really, if there were better understanding, that would solve everything. And so, um, I think there's a huge question here, how could we do a better job of diagnosis, understanding, and, and, and treatment. Um, so that was how this patient was treated, and so what we'd like to do, in, you know, in, um, in, your, in your next step, here's a little additional reading. We can post this letter. We actually took uh, the case from uh, case records of the Massachusetts General Hospital from the New England Journal of Medicine. You can read the actual uh, case history yourself. But this is maybe the most fun thing, is, is, is to think big then, looking to the future again, very limited in terms of the amount of uh, 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 text to generate, but think about what uh, a bioengineer could could do, bringing quantitative principles to diagnosis, pathophysiology, or treatment. Uh, go beyond existing things. Uh, how could we pick this up better, or things like this, things in this domain, um, and what sort of uh, you know unusual kinds or innovative kinds of uh, treatments might you think about based about what you know? Uh, just a chance for you to be creative and think and. Uh, and uh, talk together as a as a team. Okay. Any other questions on that? Yeah. No. This is definitely we see. I haven't seen myself a case like this, but we are routinely consulted for patients on medical or surgical uh, services where someone has become uh, uh, depressed or psychotic or or otherwise delirious, and they want to know what's going on. So that's one of the most interesting. Parts of psychiatry is, is getting called to the other units of the hospital when, when psychiatric like state is induced. There are some stories on that. Yeah. Yeah. What do you guys think? Okay. Okay, thanks everyone.